Many of you know our speaker, Paul Sondell, from various communities in Madison. I know him <coughs> from the generation that has come to Capitol Lakes in succession. Jim Crow was a generation in, in front of me. I then became a professor and taught in BioCorps, and one of my undergraduate students is today's speaker, Paul Sondell. Um, so we're looking at a succession of generations connected to Capital Lakes. <clears throat> the word that I want to plant in your minds, war. And this word has two meanings in today's talk. One is what happens between cancer and the host of that cancer. The cancer comes about by just a very few changes in the genome of the cancer cell compared to those in all, all of our normal cells, some of which do grow, but they grow in a controlled way. The cancer does not grow in a controlled way. And so there's this very small difference which ends up in a big mess, as many of us know. So there's a war between the cancer and its host. And Paul Sondell tonight will talk about ways that investigators are trying to tip that balance in the war and give the host more of an advantage <coughs> against that slightly changed cancer. There's a second meaning of war, and that is what investigators around the world are trying to do <coughs> in various strategies, including that of immunotherapy. Around the war, investigators are working very hard with methods that are becoming increasingly powerful. Some of the molecular methods called the Genome Project make an enormous difference to what a researcher can do now. And so Paul will also talk about the community of warriors out there trying to help tip that balance. So we're talking about war in two very different contexts. Now many of you in this audience are familiar <coughs> with listening to recounting of the progress in war. World War II, many of you have been listening to the radio in World War II. Even more of you in the Vietnam era, where it was Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite was the trusted correspondent who told us at the end of each of his sessions that that's the way things are. Paul has agreed to serve not only as a combatant in this war, but also as a commentator. I'm really delighted that Paul Sondell can join us tonight. He is one of those nominated in the recent Moonshot program at the end of the Obama administration, the so-called Bo Biden, Biden Moonshot in cancer when it was recognized, recognized that an important strategy for the war on cancer is that of immunotherapy. Paul, thanks for joining us. This, uh, this mic, it sounds like it's working. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for being here. Uh, I know many of you tonight, is it loud enough or not loud enough? No, you need to be closer. So I'll, uh, I can use this one.
I can use this handheld mic. Let's just turn the other one off then. Okay. Is this better? Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll stick with that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sorry for the slow start. Uh, thank you, Bill, for that introduction. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, thank you for setting the stage, both when we made plans before and for your introduction tonight, uh, talking about Walter Cronkite and That's the Way It Is. Uh, I will do my best to summarize That's the Way It Is Now in this war against cancer and where we're having progress. But I also would like to finish on This is the Way We Hope It Will Be and share with you what science and clinical translational of, of that science is helping us to do to be optimistic. So I had a lovely dinner here tonight with Bill and Alexandra and with uh, Marge Tobias and had a chance to speak with Dick Rieselbach and his wife Nina and see other friends uh, that I've known for, for years, Karen Pridham and others. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, it was a very pleasant dinner and dinner conversation. I'd like to change the mood though about that. As Bill did, he used the word war. I'm going to use the word cancer. Cancer is not pleasant dinner conversation. But this is a time where you wanted to hear about progress. And so despite a very pleasant dinner, I need to talk about cancer, to talk about what it means to all of us, and to talk about the challenge that it generates to science, to medicine, and to humanity. We clearly need to do better. And so I'll talk tonight about where we're going with that, what we're trying to do. So this is a picture that should be familiar to many of you. This is where I work. This big circle isn't only the University of Wisconsin, but most of UW is there, and I know many of you have strong connections to UW. The blue circle is the hospital and the main buildings of the UW Carbone Cancer Center, although the cancer center is a matrix center that has uh, elements really spread throughout the campus. Next to it here, this is the UW Children's Hospital, where I, as a pediatric oncologist, have done clinical work caring for children with cancer. And in this first Wimmer Tower building on the fourth floor is where my laboratory is doing research, along with so many others, trying to come up with better answers through research. Uh, my disclosure is that I hold some patents through the university that are held by Wharf. But other than that, uh, although I do work with a variety of pharmaceutical companies regarding research reagents, I have no financial connections to any of them. Uh, my work with them really relates to the research itself. So this curve on the left, talking about hard cold statistics, this is a survival curve. Again, not dinner conversation. This is a graph that starts in the year I was born, 1950. You, I'm young, but I've been around for a while, and in my 68 years, I'm pleased that there's been quite a bit of progress made in the treatment of cancer. Back in 1950, virtually every child diagnosed with cancer died. Diagnosis of cancer was a death sentence. Families would bring their child to a physician and the physician would say, there's nothing we can do. We'll do our best to keep your son or daughter comfortable. Now in 2019, we're curing about 80% of those children, 8 out of 10. By curing, we mean the cancer goes away and never comes back. That's real progress. But it's not good enough, and I'll get to why it's not good enough. Here's just a picture of two twins we treated here at our program here in Madison. Both of them had the common form of childhood leukemia, the most common kind of cancer in children. They were treated about six years ago. They were diagnosed only a year apart. What a tragedy for this family. But better that it was in 2012 than in 1952. 
So with 70 years of progress in childhood cancer and 48 years since President Nixon declared war against cancer, how are we doing and, and uh, where do we still have to go? Well, we got a long way to go. We've made progress in treating childhood cancer and made progress in treating adults with cancer. The death rate from cancer is going down because of better treatment and because of better prevention. But even though the death rate is going down, look at the statistics. More adults between the ages of 40 and 70 die of cancer than anything else in the country. And more people overall, when you take all ages, almost as many die of cancer as heart disease. And in the realm of childhood cancer, even though we're curing 80% of children, because of advances in other previously fatal problems, more children die of cancer still in the United States than due to any other medical cause. The only thing that kills more children in this country, sadly, is trauma, accidents, largely motor vehicle accidents, and suicide and homicide. And this isn't cancer research, but sadly, almost all of those suicides and homicides in children are firearm related. Here in the United States, children have a 25-fold greater chance of dying a firearm death than children in other developed countries around the world. This isn't rocket science, as they say. This is something that our society should be able to take care of through legal measures and societal education. Back to cancer. So we've got a lot more work to do. For those patients that are not being cured, it's usually because their cancer might have responded to the initial treatments of radiation and chemotherapy and surgery, but small amounts of it remain, often spread in different places that we couldn't even see when the cancer was diagnosed. And even for the children and adults that are cured of their cancer, they need to spend months or years in clinic, much of that time in the hospital, suffering the side effects of really difficult to tolerate regimens of chemotherapy that are hard to accept while you're getting the treatment. And for those that are cured, they have long-term side effects from those drugs, including the chance of the cancer coming back, organ failure, infertility issues, and the most scary of all is that some of the drugs that we're using to cure people of cancer cause mutations, and those mutations can cause cancers. So the chance of new cancers coming back because of the treatment is a problem we need to get around. We need something better, or at least something in addition, to add to what we're currently doing. And the thing that we're putting our major effort into is something called immunotherapy. Everybody here understands what the immune system is. It's what protects us from influenza. It's how our immune systems were immunized to polio to prevent us from getting that. It's the same part of our body that if we needed a kidney transplant, would reject and destroy that kidney transplant unless we were given medicines to block the immune system. So the idea of immunotherapy of cancer is to use that same immune system to attack the cancer and get rid of it. And there's been much progress recently our UW, uh, University of Wisconsin, has made major progress and has been part of that. And at least in my mind, the most early use of immunotherapy manipulations clinically are the successful use of bone marrow transplant that was done here at the University of Wisconsin. The first successful bone marrow transplant done by this professor, Fritz Bach, in 1968, he devised a test that enabled him to match a patient who needed a bone marrow transplant with the right brother or sister to get that transplant. And based on that, he led a team here at UW to do the first transplant. And he taught the team in Minneapolis how to do the same thing. And they published the papers back to back together in the journal Lancet in December of 1968. And we learned later that the way the transplants work to cure patients of leukemia, which is the major disease that transplants are done for, there's now been 1.5 million transplants done worldwide. They all started here in Madison. is because of the immune system having an attack against the cancer and the leukemia. So this was in 1968. This was an important year for me also because I graduated high school and began my freshman year here at the University of Wisconsin. And early in my sophomore year at the University of Wisconsin, 
I took the biology core curriculum. And there were four professors in that class. Two of them were geneticists, Dr. Bill Dove and Millard Sussman. And it didn't take very long for me to realize that my future was going to be somehow involved in genetic research or understanding genetics. And because of their mentorship, I was able to, that same semester, start talking to geneticists who were doing clinical work and clinical care. And I had the good fortune with their mentorship to meet Fritz Bach, the man who had just done those successful bone marrow transplants. And I joined his laboratory that semester as a 19-year-old sophomore and learned from him about this idea of using the immune system to have an impact against cancer. Hello, Sue. Uh, and uh, be able to use the immune system to try and have an impact. And really since then, uh, I've spent my whole career trying to develop those concepts that I had the chance to work on with Fritz Bach in 1969 and since. I just show here, uh, some of you, while you know Bill, you might not know that he is incredibly active and productive still. This is a paper that he just published this past month in uh, one of the world's most prestigious scientific journals, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, in the area that he has made a huge impact understanding the genetics and biology of colon cancer development. So, I mentioned before that we were able to prove that the way bone marrow transplants help to treat leukemia is through the immune system. I won't go through the details of the graph, but after I joined the faculty here in 1980, my first 10 years here were studying bone marrow transplants, and I worked with the International Bone Marrow Transplant Registry in Milwaukee, and we were able to look at the results of people that were transplanted for leukemia, and were able to use that information and publish it here in 1990, and prove that the way it worked is because of an immune reaction that the cells from the healthy donor were making in the leukemia patient against the leukemia. The complexity of that, though, is if, if you take cells from somebody else and put them into the patient, those cells from someone else can react against the patient as if the patient, him or herself, is a foreign graft. It's called graft versus host disease. And so you need to give drugs to suppress that. And so there's a delicate balance between letting the graft attack the leukemia, but not having the graft attack the patient. So based on that work, this whole field of cancer immunotherapy came to a fork in the road. And as Yogi Berra said, we're taking both. <laughs> we are looking at first the way that we can use the cells from a healthy donor and take those cells and give them to a patient in a way where they can attack the cancer but not attack the patient. And there's a lot of progress being made in that. But I'm going to focus instead on the other fork in the road and that's where we can take the cells from the patient and try and get them to attack the cancer. But as Bill said, there is a war going on in the patient even before the cancer is diagnosed. And if the immune system wins that war, it means that individual never knows that there was cancer there because the cancer was eliminated. If the cancer is detected clinically so that someone is diagnosed with cancer, it means at least as of that point, the cancer is winning the war. The immune system is not doing enough to stop that cancer. So if we want to use that patient's immune system to now win the war, we've got to get the immune system to do something it wasn't able to do on its own, something almost superhuman. And that's where pharmacologic intervention comes in to get the immune system to do things it wouldn't be, out, be able to do without help. So. Over those past many decades, there's been quite a bit of progress. And as of 2013, there were two areas of major progress that had a real impact on patients with cancer. For many decades before, cancer immunotherapy was something we did in test tubes in mice. But starting in about 2010, a therapy called CAR T-cell therapy, where immune cells of the patient were genetically modified so that they had in them the tools to recognize their own cancer and start destroying it. This started being used. The problem is the cost of this therapy is $500,000 per dose. Cost-benefit analysis has been done, at least for younger people, that have 
a very bad cancer that can only be cured with this approach, and it still comes out on the side of getting the therapy over going through all of the other long treatments that might not be effective. The other therapy that was proven to be effective is something called checkpoint blockade, where for patients whose immune system is trying its best to win the war, but the cancer is turning off the immune system, it's putting the brakes on the immune system, if you can take those brakes off, then it turns on the ability of the immune cells to attack. So that checkpoint blockade has made a real hit, so much so that last year that concept won the Nobel Prize. I know this investigator now at MD Anderson. We were on a study section together uh, at the NCI, Jim Allison, and he invented this concept of taking the brakes off the immune system to let the immune system do something it's trying to do. And a, a separate colleague working in Japan worked on this concept as well. And they shared the Nobel Prize last year for this cancer immunotherapy work, not only because of its promise in the laboratory, but because the promise is really being played out in helping many patients with cancer around the world. So just going back to what cancer treatment looked like for a particular disease before this was used, this is a survival curve for adults with melanoma. And what you're seeing here is that patients with high-risk melanoma, stage four, as of 2001, virtually all of these patients eventually die of melanoma. It means as of 2001, there was no effective treatment that really made a difference for this disease. Now with the concept of checkpoint blockade, this data published only two years ago, when two separate checkpoint blockade drugs are used to take the brakes off, this survival curve is a lot better than the one I just showed you. And this is a flat survival curve, so it looks like these patients are being cured. Because these drugs are new, we don't have 20 years of follow-up for these patients. They've only really been used for the past 12 years or so. But there are a large number of melanoma patients who got this drug or this approach 12 years ago who remain alive today without any sign of melanoma. So it looks like this combination might be curing somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of patients that used to have a completely fatal disease. Well, is the glass half empty or half full? Clearly, it's a step in the right direction, but it still means that 60 percent of these patients or more are still dying of their cancer, and that's only for melanoma. This is the disease where this kind of therapy works best. For most other adults with cancer, these drugs don't work as well, although we're seeing some benefit. And for most children with cancer, this approach is not making a difference. So let me talk about children with cancer. This is where we focus much of our work. This is a disease called neuroblastoma. Even though it's got neuro in it, it's not a brain cancer. It's a cancer of the nerve cells that grow in either the adrenal gland or the sympathetic ganglia in clusters of nerves uh, outside the spinal cord. Most children that have this disease are either the lower intermediate risk, and they do okay with a moderate amounts of chemotherapy. But about half of these children have high-risk disease, and for them, the best of combined chemotherapy as of 2009 was only curing about 30% of these children. We needed to do, and still need to do, something better. So we began working in our laboratory using an approach that provided a collaboration. Jackie Hank working in our laboratory took neuroblastoma cells and added to them something called an antibody. You've all heard of antibodies. This was an antibody made in a laboratory so that it specifically recognized neuroblastoma. And it's shown in this cartoon, if you can see it, is these little Ys that stick to this brown neuroblastoma cell. The antibody sticks to the neuroblastoma and not to other cells, but it doesn't kill them. What kills the neuroblastoma are the white blood cells that see the antibody stuck to the cancer. And the antibody tells the white blood cells that they should stick to it and destroy the cancer. But those white blood cells do a much better job of that if they're activated with a molecule that activates white blood cells, a molecule we've done much research on called interleukin-2, or IL-2. So in essence, we showed in the test tube that IL-2 and antibody made a big difference against neuroblastoma. We spent the next 15 years doing more test tube experiments mouse experiments, first in human early clinical trials, 
expanded clinical trials, and finally did, with the help of a national consortium called the Children's Oncology Group, a group of 260 children's hospitals throughout North America. A large study where we took children who were in remission after all of their initial treatment, where they, they didn't have any neuroblastoma in them that you could see, but we knew that they had more than a 40% chance of their neuroblastoma coming back. And we did a clinical trial where half of those children got the standard treatment, a drug called retinoic acid, a vitamin A-like drug, or they got the vitamin A plus the immunotherapy I described. And we were able to show that the immunotherapy treatment was providing a real benefit to the children. That at the two-year time point, 66% were alive without any neuroblastoma we could see, as opposed to 46%. We learned of this in 2009. We stopped the research study. We said any child that had been previously assigned to the standard treatment was going to this other arm. We like to say on that phone call where we shared that information and made that decision, we increased the cure rate of neuroblastoma by 20%. So that was progress. It took five more years for the FDA to approve this approach, but it was approved in 2015. It's now the standard of care. So all children throughout North America and now most children in Europe are getting this approach for neuroblastoma. The trouble is, even the children that get this therapy, 40% of them, it doesn't work like we would like it to. And sadly, for children that start with the standard therapy and need to get into remission before they can get this, not all of them get there. 30% of children don't respond to the initial treatment. We need to do something for them. So this says this immunotherapy helps, but we need something stronger that can work against larger cancers that we can see. So we went back to the mouse model to try to understand what we could do. And a surgical resident named Eric Johnson was working in our lab with a scientist named Sasha Rachmelovich. And he took a melanoma and put it in the side of a mouse and let it grow so it was just barely big enough that you could feel it, not even big enough to measure. So it's small, but it's bigger than the cancer we were treating in those children in remission. And he showed that if we used an antibody in IL-2, if we gave that immunotherapy intravenously, the tumors grew slower than no treatment, but they still grow. But if we gave that treatment in the tumor itself, now the, the tumor was not growing. And many of those animals were tumor-free. So it was a direct injection into the tumor. We proved we could put more of the drug into the tumor and have it work better that way. Next we asked, could this tumor respond to checkpoint blockade, the approach that's gotten the Nobel Prize last year? And we showed sadly it didn't. This particular melanoma doesn't have enough of immune molecules on it for the immune system to want to destroy it. So what happens is we give the checkpoint blockade, the tumor continues to grow. That's the red line. But if we give the anti-tumor immunotherapy, the antibody IL-2 mixed together, now it slows the tumor a lot. But if we give both together, they're doing better. So if we were mouse doctors, we'd look at this and say, this is a really successful experiment. But we're clinical doctors. And even though the tumors are growing slower, when you look at the survival curve, the tumors, even though they're, the mice are living longer, almost all of these mice go on to die. So clearly, this is not good enough for us to take into patients. So at this point, I had the privilege of having a really bright young doctor named Zach Morris. And I'm sorry, in the process of switching from one kind of computer to another, some of the text has been corrupted a little bit. But his name is Zach Morris. Uh, he finished his MD, PhD, and he joined our hospital's radiation oncology residency program as a resident and joined my laboratory to do research and worked with us from 2012 to 2016. And he took that same model. He put the melanoma into the side of the mouse, but instead of letting it grow for only seven days, he let it grow for five weeks. For a mouse, that's a long time. And for a mouse, this was really a big tumor. And what he showed is if he gave that big tumor low-dose radiation therapy, not enough to shrink it, and then injected the immunotherapy, we got results that we were very pleased with and surprised with. And here's the data. The gold line shows how the tumor grows if it's not getting any treatment. The green line shows how radiation therapy slows it down, but the tumor's still growing. The black line shows how that injection of immunotherapy slows it down, but it's still growing. 
But when we combine the two, now these big tumors in mice, really for the first time that we'd ever seen, are shrinking away, and three-fourths of the mice are tumor-free and seem to be cured. And we can take those mice that have been cured, they get the radiation, they get the immunotherapy, they're now cured, and we can then inject them with the same tumor that would have killed them before, and they reject it. Their immune systems are now immune. And so what we've proven by this and other experiments we've done in this setting is that by irradiating the tumor and then injecting the immunotherapy, we're turning the cancer that was growing there in the mouse into a vaccine. We don't have to take uh, uh, molecules outside the animal and inject them in with the vaccine, but rather we're putting immunotherapy into the tumor and letting the tumor that's there vaccinate the mouse. And the advantage of this, if we were to take this clinically, is this could be what's called off-the-shelf therapy. This is individualized, personalized medicine where each patient would be getting a treatment that's specific for their own tumor. But it could be off the shelf because we could use uh, this immunotherapy approach that could be in any hospital pharmacy in vials. So we need to do a lot more work in order to get there clinically. So the problem with the experiment I just showed you is that mouse only had one cancer. But as I mentioned before, patients who don't respond to their treatment with cancer usually die if they're going to because of areas of cancer in distant places. So we took this model system and said, let's put two tumors into this mouse. We'll put a tumor into one side and a tumor into the other side so that we'll irradiate the tumor in one side that's big and we'll inject it with the immunotherapy. And we'll know that there's another tumor there that we didn't treat. And what we're hoping is that we'll treat the big tumor with the radiation, inject it, turn on that vaccine approach, cure the animal of this big tumor, and get the immune system to attack the distant tumor. Well, that's what we thought what would happen, and this is why you have to do experiments, because when we did the experiment, it didn't work that way. We were terribly disappointed. What we saw is if the animal only had one tumor and got the radiation and the immunotherapy, that tumor that we irradiated and injected would be cured. But if there was a distant tumor that we didn't treat at all, even our treatment to the tumor that got the radiation and the injection didn't work. Those tumors continued to grow. What this tells us is that this distant cancer that we didn't do anything to is having some crosstalk. It's having an influence on what our treatment is doing at this site. And we've done mechanistic work to understand what the immunologic mechanism of that is. But what's we think gratifying is we can get around it by giving checkpoint blockade. So this is where that concept of taking the brakes off can help. If we give the radiation and inject with the immunotherapy, the IL-2 and the antibody, and we give checkpoint blockade, now that tumor that we treated is gone. And more importantly, if you look at the tumor on the other side, the tumor that didn't get any radiation, it didn't get injected with immunotherapy, it goes away as long as the big tumor got the radiation and the immunotherapy, as long as we made that big tumor function as a vaccine. So this was pretty exciting to us. And based on this, sorry, the, the text got screwed up here so you can't read it. Uh, it looked good on my computer, but the bottom line here is that we've been approved by the US Food and Drug Administration and by our UW Human Subjects Committee to do the first in the world testing of this concept in patients with melanoma. This study is now approved and it is ready to start accruing patients this summer where all patients with advanced melanoma that enter this study will get in a, a dose of radiation to the site of the cancer that we will inject with the antibody IL-2 to try and make it into a vaccine and then get this combined checkpoint blockade, just like works in mice. We're very excited about it, but like any research that translates from the mouse or the lab to the clinic, as much as we're excited about this and we hope it works, in all likelihood it's not going to work as well in patients as it works in mice. But we'll learn something about it to be able to study what we can do to make it work better. So I'm excited we're going in that direction. We're also working with David Vale in our School of Veterinary Medicine to do the exact same approach in dogs with melanoma where we can do some additional modeling to understand by imaging what's actually happening during the treatment. So where do we go from here? We want to do uh, treatments to deliver low-dose radiation 
not by external beam, but by injecting the radiation as molecules uh, into the patient so that they go specifically to the cancer. And there are other newer forms of immunotherapy that we're testing to add to what I just show you to make a difference. Uh, let me just mention a little bit of this in, in a bit. The next few slides I've got here I wanted to show because two weeks ago was the UW Advocacy Day at the state capitol. And the dean of each school at the University of Wisconsin picked one faculty member to represent their school and talk to state legislators as an example of work going on in their school. And I was very pleased that uh, Dean Golden asked me to represent the medical school. And one of the things that the legislators asked is if we could let them know how what we're doing research on, how it's making an impact on the people of Wisconsin. So uh, for the people of Wisconsin, first and foremost, we think the work that we and others in the Cancer Center are doing is trying to cure cancer. That's our long-term primary goal. We want to incorporate the kind of evidence-based research that we're doing in the lab into clinical testing to come up with treatments that are more effective, less difficult to tolerate, have fewer side effects. We know we are getting there, and that is more important than everything else combined. Second, we're training the next generation of caregivers, of researchers, of clinicians to be able to ask the next questions that are important. Within our laboratory, we've got a variety of people training at various levels, physicians, scientists, PhD students, medical students, undergraduates. In addition, uh, we work with a variety of other kinds of faculty members and disciplines in our research and in our clinical work and we're training clinical trainees on the wards that are participating in these research trials, trying to come up with better answers through doing clinical research. Next, for those legislators who like to look at the bottom line in terms of dollars and cents, the Cancer Center is generating quite a bit of funding for the state of Wisconsin, roughly $100 million per year of extramural grants coming into Wisconsin because of grants at our Carbone Cancer Center. And finally, with respect to the business sector, spin-off companies that arise from the University of Wisconsin, as well as interactions between UW and private business, are having a real impact on technology uh, implementation. Now, I'll just give two examples of, of two biotech companies in town that we're interacting with, uh, one that I'm working with and one my colleague, Zach Morris, is working with. So in Venera, is a company that is making monoclonal antibodies. Like I mentioned, the antibodies we're using as part of our immunotherapy, their goal is to make better antibodies. So uh, if, if this is a cancer cell that has this tumor marker A on it, let's call it that, those are those blue dots, if you make an antibody against that marker A, the antibody will bind to that tumor. But unfortunately, this marker is present at a low level on some normal cells in the body like some nerve cells. And because of that, when you treat with this antibody, as much as the antibody will bind to the cancer and hopefully kill it using the approaches I mentioned, it'll bind to the nerve cell and cause some pain. We'd like to avoid that. So there's another marker that's on tumor cells. It's typified by the red dot, we'll call it tumor marker B. If you make a separate antibody against that, it'll recognize the tumor cell but that separate marker is on liver cells. So if you make an antibody against marker B, you'll attack the tumor cells but cause trouble to the liver cells. So what Invenra is doing is they're making an antibody that has to see both A and B at the same time. If it sees only one or the other, it's not going to stick. But by seeing both, it will bind to the tumor cell, and it won't bind to the nerve, shouldn't cause pain, won't bind to the liver. So this is a way of making an immunotherapy that's much more specific. We're very excited about this. And just two months ago, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation provided funding to a collaborative venture between this company and our laboratory to develop this concept. Next is a company in town called Archaeus. This was founded by Jamie Weikert, a colleague of ours, who's making a way to put a radioactive molecule onto something that binds to tumors but not well to normal tissues. And it's a way of getting radiation therapy to go to cancers and not to the normal tissue. 
And this is very important. We got a pilot grant from WARF and the UW Graduate School, and all five of our faculty have worked together on this over the past two years. And as a result of this, as Bill mentioned, one of the grants that we got is from this Bo Biden moonshot to develop this concept in a big way. And here's how we're hoping to make this work. Uh, this is Ravi Patel, who's a postdoc working in Zax Morris's lab. We're collaborating together. What he's done in mice is try and make what's happening in these mice simulate really difficult to treat cancer in patients. So what he's done is he puts cancer into both sides of the mouth. So you've got big tumors that you can see in both flanks. And he injects cancer intravenously into the mouse so it spreads everywhere. So that if these mice are untreated, they, un they will die of large cancers in both flanks and metastatic disease primarily causing lung dysfunction. And all of these mice will die with cancer spread all over. So what we're doing is asking, what can we do to have an impact on these mice? So we're treating them with this in situ vaccine approach that I mentioned, where we irradiate the cancer and inject the tumor with the immunotherapy. We're also using this molecular targeted radiotherapy with the radioactive molecules we can inject intravenously that go to the cancer but not normal tissue. And we're also using this checkpoint inhibition. And we're using all of these ideas in combination. And the question is, what happens when you treat these mice? And here's the answer in these bars. Each of these bars represents a different group of mice. And the labels have gotten corrupted a little bit. I apologize. But uh, the, the first four bars are the individual treatments. And anything that's red or blue means the mouse died. Green means not only did the mouse survive, but there's no cancer in the mouse. And we proved that the mouse has an immune memory response because it can reject another challenge of the same tumor. And it's only the group that got all three of these things that has 10 out of 11 mice alive and cured. So it was this combination of the in situ vaccine, which is really something that would be getting the immune engine started, combined with this molecular radiotherapy, which would be the equivalent of pushing on the gas, and then using the checkpoint inhibition, which is like taking off the brake, that got the immune system really going against this very difficult to treat cancer. So, at this point, we're not yet ready to be trying this in patients. But this is our goal to get there. So I wanted to mention that in order to do this, we need lots of people working together. Uh, here's names of people that I've tried to mention as I went through the talk. But these are people either working in my laboratory or in our cancer center together on these concepts. We've got people that we're collaborating with around the country in various consortium at St. Jude's, uh, in biotech and at the NIH. This is a picture of a, our laboratory team of the people doing the test tube and mouse work. This is a picture of our pediatric oncology team doing not only the clinical trials work, but the clinical care of all children with cancer that live within our central Wisconsin region. In order to do this work, we also need grant support. And each of these separate logos represents a separate funding agency that is providing support to us to be able to help get this work done. This work is expensive, but without the grant support, we wouldn't be anywhere. And we're pleased with the progress we're making. And finally, are the kids and the families themselves. Every five years or so, we have a reunion of our former childhood cancer patients. At this point, our team has a, a mailing list of 1,500 children who've been cured of their childhood cancer. And they range in age from being children still to being in their 40s. And uh, these people will come back and have a reunion with us. About one in five of our former patients will want to come back from miles away and join us. And I'm reminded that these children came to us in desperate circumstances with their parents learning from us that their child has cancer at a time when they had no idea what the diagnosis was going to be. But they put their trust in us and said, we'd like you to give the best treatment you have available for our children. But they also said yes when we said, the reason we know what we're providing is the best treatment available is because of the clinical research that's gotten us to where we are. And with your permission, 
we'd like your children to participate in this next generation of clinical trials, which we've proven provides the best treatment currently, but also will help provide us answers for the next generation of children to do better with. And they said yes. So these children were cured largely with treatments that came out of laboratory work done in the 60s through the 90s. Based on the kind of immunotherapy work that our lab and really thousands of other labs around the world are doing that is now being translated into efficacy, we have real optimism that the kind of treatments we'll be able to provide 10 years from now or 20 years from now will be providing more effective cures for many more patients, hopefully with less toxicity. And we're all eager to get there, if only research could move faster. Thanks so much. Hi, Murray. I'd be happy to take questions. Dick. The progress that you describe in this presentation is fantastic, and your part of the, your part of this progress has also been uh, very impressive. The question I have is: there a message, possibly regarding um, immune aspects of cancer? in that transplant patients who get long-standing immune suppressive therapy often get cancer in the central nervous system in the brain, uh, particularly lymphoma in the brain. Is there some message there? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I do think there is a message there. And uh, Dick, uh, while being a uh, accomplished nephrologist, also has a history of cancer research, and we've talked several times about work that he did uh, early on in his career, giving chemotherapy to help treat cancer that was growing in the brain but not growing elsewhere. And part of this is because of a part of our anatomy that protects our brain from toxic molecules that we might have eaten. Uh, in evolutionary times, if our ancestors ate something that they shouldn't have that was really toxic, it could make their body sick but something called the blood-brain barrier prevented that molecule and others from getting into the brain and causing damage. And so because of that, uh, some of the drugs that we use to treat cancer don't penetrate into the brain very well. In addition, there's something about the brain where the immune system doesn't work quite as well. And so patients that are on immunosuppressive drugs for their transplant, where the drugs are knocking out the immune system, don't knock it out entirely, but they come close to it. But it might be that they're more potent at knocking out the little bit of immunity we've got in our brains to protect it. I did mention to Dick earlier, though, that at least both in mouse models and in patients that are getting treated with immune therapies that we know turn on potent immune cells to treat cancer. It's been possible to show that those cells, when injected intravenously or when growing elsewhere in the body can penetrate into the brain through that blood-brain barrier and attack cancer that's in the brain as long as we're not giving immune suppressive drugs. So I think that the message likely is that the immunosuppression those transplant patients are getting is having a greater effect on blocking the immune surveillance mechanisms in the brain than they are elsewhere. I think that's a reasonable hypothesis, although nobody's proven it. I'll be Wait, I'll bring the microphone. I'm just wondering if the time difference between uh, how these react in the mice compared to how they would react in a human, um, does that have anything to do with how fast you get approval to use these in humans? Or, or is, is the National Institute of Health, whoever approves it, are they acting fast enough? It, it's a great question and uh, you get different answers from different people. The FDA is the federal organization that ultimately makes the approval as to whether a drug is approved or not. But in order to get to the point where you're even close to being able to ask the FDA for approval, you need grant support to do the research first in mice, and then to do the early clinical trials, and then the proof of principle and proof of result clinical trial called a phase three trial, and all of that requires money which either has to come from industry if they're developing the approach, 
or if it's an academically oriented research approach like all of the ones i presented it needs to come from federal grants largely and so you need to get the grants supported through peer review all of this takes time for some approaches that are very applicable to a huge number of cancer patients like this checkpoint blockade it took about ten years between the time the concept was identified in mice by jim allison to the point where there were human analogs of this approach that could be tested in patients once the testing in patients began because there were so many patients who were showing improvement to this the approval by the fda of this approach was very quick it only took about four years our drug that we used to treat children with neuroblastoma we published in 1990 that it worked in the test tube in 1994 that it worked in mice our clinical trials of this approach began in 1996 and it took until 2010 for the slowly moving forward neuroblastoma research because of the rarity of that disease for us to publish the critical phase three paper that allowed the FDA to approve the drug in 2015. The, the other end of the spectrum is this concept called CAR T cells where immune cells from a patient can be modified genetically and this is the approach that is currently billed at five hundred thousand dollars per patient but this is an approach that's been used for children with leukemia who have had their cancer come back after the best of chemotherapy they then got the best curative approach to treat them in that setting a bone marrow transplant and the leukemia came back and as of 2010 there was nothing that these patients could be offered other than something to slow it down and that's when the CAR T cell treatment began the initial CAR T cell trials started in 2000 and 12 and the first patient was treated at the University of Pennsylvania her name is Emily Whitehead uh, and she was cured of her leukemia and over the next two years 90 percent of the children with this refractory leukemia went into remission and it looks like half of them are being cured and as a result this drug was approved by the FDA after only three years of clinical testing so it's really a, a record for clinical cancer drug approval Are there any children who are refused in the program because of no financial, um, that their parents just don't have the finances to do this? The answer to that, sadly, is huge, but not in the United States. In I'm India, oh. in China, in countries that don't have the resources that we have, too many children don't have the access to resources to make these kinds of treatments available and it's a terrible tragedy here in the United States there are probably some families who might not be getting the support thank you might not be getting the support that they need but any approach that's been approved by the FDA as helpful for children with cancer is being covered by Medicaid and because of that families throughout the country that don't have resources through their own third-party payer or HMO should have access to Medicaid and through negotiation between Medicaid and the hospitals and the providers uh, hospitals around the country have agreed if it's an FDA approved approach or even if it's not yet FDA approved but it's an experimental protocol that has passed successfully the phase one and the phase two criteria and is still experimental but it's phase three those are all being covered by Medicaid. One here and one back here. Back to you first. Oh, thank you. Could you speak to the cure that Jimmy Carter received for his brain cancer using the immune system? I can and I did. He received checkpoint blockade. He received the therapy that merited the Nobel Prize last year. He received this uh, approach that I showed you, the survival curve for melanoma, where the two drugs together make a real impact. And he not only is our former president, but he's an example of many of the questions and comments that came up. His melanoma that came back, came back in the brain. 
an area that in the past we thought the immune system didn't do a good job of getting to. He got treated with this checkpoint blockade approach, drugs injected intravenously. And it's not that the drugs that he got injected intravenously went to the brain, it's that the drugs that got injected intravenously took the brakes off the cells in his immune system so they could go to the brain and get rid of the cancer that he had in his brain. So this is a, a clear example of how immunotherapy works and it's made a huge difference for many patients with melanoma. Yes? Uh, Dr. Sandel, uh last week I had a craniotomy that uh, revealed three tumors uh, and they turned out to be metastatic melanoma. Uh, one was biopsied and totally removed as far as they know. And rather than go into any my personal details, I'd like to get your card if I may and, and have my doctors come work with you. I am seeing a uh, an immunologist at SSM Health and a radiation oncologist. So I'm so uh, my first my reaction is to say I'm very sorry to learn this news and I, I wish so much that uh, this was not the news you were given. But given that, it is something that makes sense to be talking with your physicians about the treatments that I mentioned. While there are experimental trials that are being done, mm -hmm. the approaches that I mentioned are also available without uh, experimental trials. This checkpoint blockade approach that I mentioned, that's this is standard drug that's available, and my guess is that your physicians are talking with you about that approach and combining it with radiation therapy, which really fits with the data that I showed that is working in mice, and there's clinical data saying that it makes sense. I'm seeing the immuno-oncologist on that's Friday. That's yes. exactly right, and if, if you want, maybe after we're done, with the whole group, I'd be happy to talk with you one on one and just answer some more specific questions. I'd like questions. that. Thank sure. you. Okay. Now, I think this is sort of a, shall I say, a technical question with the laboratory. To this day, I can't understand. You're working with mice. We are a bigger animal. How do you how do you determine the dosages, so to speak, in your research? Yes, that's a very excellent question, and uh, the the simple answer is uh, a mouse weighs about one two thousand of what a human does, and in order to achieve the concentrations in the blood or in the organs of a mouse that we could achieve in patients, we would give roughly one two thousandth the dose of what we give to a patient. So in past decades, people argued strongly that what you do in mice really can't predict the results that you get in patients. And sadly, immunotherapy got sort of a bad name back in the 1970s because it was possible to take healthy mice and immunize them in certain ways and turn on in them an immune response that could make an immune attack against tiny amounts of cancer. That approach then was moved into the clinic where you would take that same approach that had been given to a healthy mouse without cancer and it was given to patients with large amounts of metastatic cancer in multiple places and it didn't work. And so the non-immunotherapy researchers looked at those results and said, well, we tried immunotherapy, it didn't work. Let's move on to something different. But instead, if we do mouse testing, where mice have big tumors for mice, in multiple places for mice, in a way that looks like what's happening in patients, and we give drugs at doses in the mice that are correct for the mouse tissues to correspond to what we see in patients, in general, Things that don't work in mice won't work in patients. Things that do work in mice at least sometimes do work in patients. They often don't, but sometimes they do, and that's where we're focusing. 
Bill. I'm good. Good idea. Paul, I want to thank you. Paul, you've been both a combatant and a co correspondent. <coughs> and uh, to, to really summarize where you've gotten, you're talking about uh, a war that affects some of us, some of in our generation, affects our next generation, and affects many generations down the line. In the concept of war, remember that it took a consortium, a bunch of different armies to defeat Napoleon at Waterloo. You <laughs> emphasized how this is a community of science that is functioning and does need support. And so in total summary of where you have taken us, I would <coughs> re paraphrase Walter Cr Cronkite by saying, and that's the way it is, May 9th, 2019. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Bill. And, and thank you all for your attention. And uh, it was really a pleasure and privilege to have a chance to meet with you and to speak with you. Thanks so much. I'd be happy to answer individual questions if people want to talk one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks again.